So, a very warm welcome to everybody around the world that is uh, joining us. For the first time, we're also uh, live streaming on uh, YouTube and on LinkedIn. Um, so again, a very warm welcome. And it's uh, undoubtedly going to be quite a special session as uh, the guest of today is Karis Bright. And uh, Karis, well, for many of the viewers who won't need any introduction, <laughs> But uh, let me just uh, summarize some highlights in her career. Over the past 15 years, she has been uh, the chief marketing officer of uh, ICI Paints uh, with Dulux, later for, merged into Axo Noble, uh, Virgin, Virgin Mobile, um, British Airways, and now at uh, the BBC, you're the chief customer officer. And um, I mean, it's, uh, it's an incredible track record and we've worked uh, quite closely together over the years. And I've seen the impact that you made uh, in the companies uh, that you led the, the, the marketing and demand side of the business. And that's really impressive. A true honor to have you uh, in our webinar today. And I really look forward to, uh, to, to diving in straight into the content, into leadership lessons and everything. But let me start by asking you, where are you and how are you, Karis? Oh, thank you, Frank, and thank you for your really kind words. Um, I am at work. <laughs> this is my office. <laughs> and like, I guess many people on the call, particularly those who are in countries really, really deeply affected with COVID, you're probably uh, now sort of living at work. Um, so I'm at home in my home office in West London. Um, and I'm very well. Um, in the context of living through really, really extraordinary times. But uh, I feel very privileged. I have space, I have outside space, good friends and family um, and, and health wise very, very well. So I, I hope everyone on the call is in a similar situation. Great. Well, you know, I said, I, I can't wait to dive straight, straight in. Let's, let's dive in on this question. So, so we have COVID, uh, you're a leader in a very large organization. What what have you learned? What leadership learn did you le uh, what leadership lesson did you learn through this COVID experience? Uh, it's a really good question, and um, I think there are three things that I've reflected on that I think I've really learned, and some of it is about how the BBC responded and being part of that, and some of it is my personal experience of, of leading teams through this this process. I have to say, as a leader of a big organization, um, this situation that we find ourselves in, first and foremost, has unequivocally connected us all to why we exist. Um, so the purpose of the BBC to inform, to educate and entertain, we have to broadcast, we have to let the world know what's going on, we have to connect uh, people to the facts, to the changing situations, we also have to entertain. Let's face it, um, times are difficult and we all need a bit of escapism. So we've got a massive role to keep up the spirit of the mood of the nation, bring the nation together. And in the UK in particular, when schools closed, um, we found a unique role in actually educating the country. Um, we have a lot of education resources and we put our talent to play. And we had to do all of that with the vast majority of people working from home, like many people, only 10% of the BBC were in buildings with 21,000 people. So the vast majority of our organization was at home. And we had to pivot really fast to make sure we could deliver all of those things. Uh, but it just connected us all to why we exist, what really matters, yeah. because in an organization like the BBC with politics and competitors and many, many, external influences it just cuts through and has connected us to why we really really exist so that's sort of rooting us to what really matters and when the chips are down how you choose to focus your time and energy and why we're all here it also made me feel very really proud to be part of an organization like the bbc at such a difficult time and quite privileged to be on the inside to a degree of some of the situations as they were unfolding so it connected us to our purpose in a way that is really difficult with all of the external influences that are going on. The noise, it just cut through the noise, I think, of being in a business. The second thing is, wow, could we simplify when we had to? <laughs> could we cut the bureaucracy when we had to? 
could we break down silos when we had to? And A, we were all unified. We all knew what we had to do. And we all wanted to make it happen. And I think as an organisation, we're big, we're complex, like I'm sure the organisations that many people are in. And we just learned that you absolutely can radically simplify what you do, remove bureaucracy, get things done, make decisions. And that's been quite important to the confidence of our organisation, actually, um, to believe we can do these things. We can be simple and fast yeah. and agile. And I think we'd lost the belief that we could do that. And I think the third thing is probably a very personal one. Um, it's kind of reminded me of the power of human connection. Um, but probably not in the way that people think, not that you suddenly miss being able to be with people and touch people and, uh, and, and have different types of conversations. For me, particularly in the early stages, I've never felt more connected to the teams and the organisation. I was having many more conversations, seeing many more of my teams yeah. far more frequently um, and importantly, seeing into their lives um, because we're all in our living rooms, our bedrooms, our kitchens. I've learned more about my team's families um, because there is a wander in the background and say hello. The challenges my teams face with young children, because you're living in their, you're working in their lives. And I think um, it's connected us in a really powerful way. Um, we had, I had a very, um, I get a very personal experience. We were holding a call for five, all of my team, 500 of my team. And we'd asked um, different people from the team to talk about, share their experience. So people caring with young children or with elderly parents or flat sharing. And we were just trying to boost people's spirits and let people know we're all in difficult situations, but it's all okay. We can all find our own way. And I was listening to my team's talk and I was really inspired by it. And just to the end of the call, um, I just shared something which I probably wasn't expecting to share. And I told them that my father had gone into hospital um, of course, we couldn't visit him. And I just said that I was finding this personally really, really hard. Uh, and I was finding I was having to get energy from different places and take some time out, go for lots of long walks. Um, and it was just the end of a call. The feedback I had from that, and mostly in a way, <laughs> made me feel a bit bad because people said, we suddenly realise you're a human being. <laughs> And you're our leader and we see you and respect you, but it really, we know that you're living lives like the rest of us. And the pouring out I had of offers of support, of help, but just people who said to me, thank you for sharing with that. It now makes me feel better that I am okay to take a bit of time out in my day and I'm not alone in feeling like that. And it probably shouldn't surprise us, but it really did surprise me that the power of that human connection and just being a bit more humble and open with the team is connected us, I think, in ways that um, probably would never have happened had this situation not have existed. It's almost like it reminds me of, uh, so we identify sometimes with a role, like for example, as a parent, and you forget that, and you, you know, you want to be, I want to behave like a good father and, you know, who, who, who makes sure children behave all right and all of that. And you forget that actually the most important thing you bring as a father is, is not your role as a father, but the human being you are. Yeah. And the same is true for leaders. I see many people that climb the ranks and then think they need to behave differently. Whereas the biggest value they can bring is just bring themselves, their, their true yeah. authentic selves. Yeah, no, I, I love it. And I completely relate to that. Uh, thanks for sharing that, uh, Karis. So Karis, when we have we've prepared this uh, this webinar this this conversation and and because we worked in the, in quite a few instances together um, it was actually sort of easy to to unpack the, 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 let's say your approach to leadership your formula and i jokingly called it the caris recipe and and so basically in in our conversation we we distilled five key characteristics that, that, that you feel um, that, that, that have helped you, you know, be effective as a leader. And, uh, and, and I think it would be really nice for the viewers to, let's go through them one by one. I think, uh, so, so as I told you, the, the viewers of this, uh, of this webcast are, um, are, are on average a very senior crowd uh, from all kinds of different industries. And, and what they're really keen to learn, the feedback we consistently get, 
is, is lessons for leaders that apply to different industry and that they can apply themselves. So, um, so, so, so shall we do that? Shall we talk through each of those five? You, you want to start, Karis? I'll have a go. And um, I'm not sure that anything I will say will be that original, which always feels a little bit scary. But I guess uh, as we were, as you say, we we're talking, um, maybe one of the, I mean, I've been around for a long time, right? And as you said, I've for 15 years been a chief marketing officer and I've done that in, in four or five very different industries and very different cultures and organizations. And I think um, that's helped me, I think, uh, focus on a few key things um, that I thought might be worth sharing with the group. Um, and I think the first thing that's really, as I reflect, served me really, really well is I think I'm innately quite a curious person. Um, I'm a scientist by training. Um, I'm actually probably a little bit too much interested in other people's businesses, um, but I've always had a fascination for businesses, for different business models, how things work, why they work, how businesses make money, why do people behave in the way that they behave, why do customers behave in the way that they behave. And I think that enthusiasm and innate curiosity has really, really served me well to try and really distill down how do things work. Also a curiosity, I think probably more importantly in people and in the people that run businesses. So the teams that I'm a, a part of or might maybe leading. And that curiosity is not just what they're doing in their job, but I'm interested in what their story is, what, why they are doing the job they're doing, where they've come from. It's quite extraordinary. We had a, an exercise in the BBC quite recently where the, the new top team were, were sharing our stories. and. My, my assumptions about where the leaders have come from proved to be, in every case, completely unfounded, that people's journeys in their careers were very different than I had thought. And it just made me see them in different ways as more complete individuals. But also I'm very curious about what people are up to, what they're wanting to do now, what they're leading for, what matters to them. Uh, what are they loving about their job in the organization, what gets in the way? And then critically, I'm always looking for what can I do to help? Um, so everyone wants to have an impact. People are trying to do great things. And if I am in an organization and new into an organization, I'm always looking for well, what can I do to help? How is my role going to help you achieve what you're going to achieve? There's a good chance that if I do something that helps you, you're going to feel good about uh, my life inside the organization. So I think that curiosity has served me really well. And in particular, the power of a good question. Um, I think as leaders, we often think we're often there for answers, right? And at some point you do need to have some good answers, but don't ever underestimate the power of a really, really good question. Think about the question. I would often, if I were joining a new organization, have three or four common questions I would ask everybody. And then I would look for some of the connections that, that I could sort of build on. Of course, we now want to know, we want to know which three questions. To... <laughs> <laughs> well, they're often about, um, well, if, if I'm trying to quickly get um, an understanding of an organization, simple, what, what makes us really good? What makes us really good and really strong? What really gets in the way? What do you, and yeah, so those some things, and yeah. what could I do to solve it? In my role, what do you want me to do? Um, so I, and then there's a few others around it, but I often start with those kind of first three just and but you have to ask it of a lot of people. So not just three or four people and throughout the organization and and often not where you think the power might reside, um, but just building up that picture. You, you can often get very quickly a sense of the organ organizations often know what they're good at and what their strengths are. They know what the issues are. And people aren't backwards in telling you what they want you to do differently. And um, I found that really, really sort of really helpful. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned curiosity as the first. It's actually one of the five attitudes of um, a model that we call the real growth or the Da Vinci growth CMO. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a model we developed uh, together with uh, Spencer Stewart, the, the, the world's largest uh, CMO headhunter. And... Uh, and, and, and in our leadership program, we unpacked that and we, and we looked at what are the behaviors and the attitudes that come with that. And, and one of them was very, that very clearly stood out was humility. Mm -hmm. Like you need to be humble 
you know, if you're curious, you don't put yourself above others. And, and I think that mindset is, uh, is, is inviting so much learning from others, exactly as you said. Yeah. yeah so and I'm, I, I'm, I'm sure many people are familiar with Stephen Covey's The Sort of Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. But the one that's always resonated with me is seek first to understand before you're understood. And all too often we go into places, into meetings with wanting to be understood, to have our agenda understood and just sitting back and first of all, try and work out what's going on around here, really seeking to understand and to listen. And I know in the BBC, um, I joined um, at the beginning of the summer um, and the BBC is quite quiet over the summer. In August, a lot of people go on holiday and um, things sort of wind down a little bit. And I had just started. So I decided to just go on a bit of a trip and um, we're not a, we are a global organization but I was focusing on the nations and regions of the UK so I went on a bit of a tour to Scotland to Ireland to Wales um, and into some of the regions just to talk with the teams there and that's not the power base of the BBC um, but I just wanted to just quickly I thought I've got some time I may not have the time again so quickly let's just go out and meet people and um, it did actually prove to be incredibly insightful, but what I didn't quite underestimate, what I didn't know at the time was the impact that it had on the organization, the fact that I did it. Um, most people say, you've been here in your first six weeks of Scotland. Uh, people don't come in their first six years because yeah. you don't need to. Um, and I had chosen to do that. And um, uh, it actually has had a really lasting mark on the I actually haven't been back to Scotland <laughs> in the last two years. But in a way, I went there really early, really at the start. They feel that they kind of mattered. And um, uh, that sort of, that curiosity, but also thinking through how do I bring the organisation to get to know me and with me quite early has, has proved to be important. Yeah, yeah, good, thanks. So, 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 so the carries recipe. Yeah. <laughs> curiosity is the first one, tick in the box. What, what, what else? I think the second thing for me is, is context. And I think context is kind of everything um, businesses have history teams have histories things can be quite complicated and I think um, one thing I've learned is the better you understand the context that you're operating in the better the choices are that you're going to make on what you choose to do and that context isn't always obvious it sometimes can be quite nuanced and you have to get beneath the surface of it if you really want to to have the right kind of impact. I'll give you an example of, um, as I reflect back, something that worked, I think, really well at British Airways. Um, in the run up uh, to me joining British Airways, um, I went and met all of the former marketing leaders of British Airways, and there have been many, <laughs> lots of people have been through British Airways, and some great, big, powerful people, Chris Janssen, Jill McDonald. And I actually went to see all of them. And actually, most people don't ever do this. I think there's probably a bit of an insecurity about not wanting to meet someone who's done your job before. And, but I just went and saw all of them. And I wanted to know two things in particular. So my questions for those guys were, what can you tell me about how to succeed? I'm an outsider coming in. Tell me a bit about the British Airways, the culture. What do I need to know? I was also asking them, what do they wish they'd done? You know, we often as leaders leave thinking, if I had my time again, I'd focus on doing this. And that's what I found to be a really good question to ask people. What do you wish you'd done? And I learned some magic from Jill McDonald that I then applied. And that gave me a bit of a, of a foundation. But then I, when I got into the role, uh, I decided I needed to do a bit of a strategy project. And um, there was a lot that needed to happen. But I chose not to commission new work but just to look at work that already existed, but through a new lens. And luckily, they're not short of insight. Though. 42 segmentations existed in British Airways. I did a segmentation of segmentations, which appealed to me. Um, and we decided to build on work. I found work that people had done before, such as Jill McDonald, that had been sat in a drawer, no one hadn't seen the light of day. And actually, all the answers are there, right? Now, we were five years on and 10 years on, so we did look at it through a slightly updated lens. We built this program of work, this body of work, and when I took it out to the leaders in the organization and presented it, even though some of it was quite challenging, actually, it, it connected really fast and was accepted really fast. And the one bit of feedback I had, I consistently had was, it's really great that you've built on what we knew. 
Yeah, no, but it's... You already knew it. And it was, and it, I did it very purposefully because people say it's a proud organisation. They're experts. They'll tell you they like outsiders, but they don't really like outsiders. Um, they don't really want, but it was a bit of an insight into the pride in the organisation and very clearly positioned the work on, you know this stuff, right? It's your work. And we've just tried to look at it through a slightly different lens. And it meant, I think, the work just happened much faster than had it felt like an outsider's perspective inside the organisation. I, I, I really like that. I even, I've started my career in market research and I played with the idea at the end of working for big agencies to, uh, to start my own agency with just doing that. So we don't do any new research. Because if only you knew what you know, yeah. because it's often dispersed in the organization, there always is a, it's not a sexy thing to say we're going to work with exist. And it's so effective for, for many reasons. And, and you mentioned a couple of them. So totally recognize, I really, really like that, that lesson. It's, I mean, many of these things are obvious and we just don't do them. Yeah. It's so much easier to start a new brief and, and a new piece of work. And there's so much value, not just in, in, in the fact, yes, definitely in the BA, the pride part plays, but also just the knowledge that's already there. And it forces you to look with a different lens. And that in itself brings a lot of value. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think what's quite interesting is, as you said, the organization changed every two years. And so people changed, things were lost. And in fact, some of the really magic uh, work that existed didn't live in the organization anymore agencies came to me and said we did this piece of work for you and it never happened and so in meeting out and reaching out I'd say to people can you send it to me and actually I got BA stuff sent back to me from agencies that no one could quite find and some of it was just brilliant yeah my predecessors have been super smart people okay. um, and I know the world had moved on five or ten years Things don't often change, that the fundamentals don't often change, why a business is good at what it's good at, what it needs to do. These things don't shift fast. Um, and so, yeah, it was, a, it, you're right, I probably should reflect on that a bit more and do less new things and more reframing of what we've already done. Uh, it's, it's, it's true. And actually, uh, I'm just preparing pre-reads for a session that's called Decoding the World. And, and one of the pieces is really about what doesn't change. Even with COVID hitting, people think everything changes. Not everything. Most things stay exact, exactly the same. <laughs> yes, there's impact, but we're, we, you know, we're, we're skewed towards the 10% that changes, not about the 90% that stays the same. So, Karis, I'm just uh, going to do a shout out to the, uh, to the audience. Uh, many of them are first time viewers. And, um, and so, um, although I, uh, fiercely agree with what Gary said. If people <laughs> or if they have questions, uh, feel free to uh, to drop them. Uh, can't promise to cover all of them, but uh, we'll definitely try. But let's first uh, finish the uh, the Gary's recipe. Okay. We've talked about curiosity and context. What else? Uh, I think the third one for me would be about clarity and, and clarity of, of purpose. I mean jobs, often big jobs, are really multifaceted. So there are many things you could choose to do. Um, and so I would say I've been most impactful when I've thought much harder about what I really am going to focus on and what I want my impact to be inside the organisation. Um, also to think about um, where your power resides in the organisation. And it's often not what people, where people think it is. It's not about the number of people you've got or the amount of budget that you've got. Often roles have got unique power inside the organisation. Can you give an um, example of that? Yeah, so, well, for example, yeah, my, my role at the BBC is a new role. Um, we put together a number of things. Um, and it's quite interesting when I reflect on the job description of what the organisation thought they wanted me to do. Some of the things in particular I've chosen to focus on are not with the job description. Um, and I think it's a combination of, of, of me coming in thinking, right, what can I uniquely bring? But also, what does my role uniquely bring? I'm one of the few people inside the BBC that connects everything. So I'm a portfolio person. Many people inside the BBC are quite understandably linked to news or TV video or to the audio organisation or, or to technology. And I kind of span everything. So that's relatively unique that I have the insight and I exist to make everything work. So I have a unique role in being a portfolio person. Um, I'm also 
of course, the audience person inside the business, the customer person inside the business. But the great thing about my new role is we've put together in the BBC the license fee unit, which are essentially people that pay for the BBC, yeah. um, and the audiences, so the consumers of the BBC. And those two teams have never really worked together before. One was a finance function, one was an audience insight function. Yeah. And actually putting those things together, it gave me this unique insight into what people really want to pay for and how it links to kind of consumption. And so I've chosen to focus on some slightly different things. And I've sort of crafted my role as a customer value creator. You know, yeah. I'm here and can uniquely help this organization really understand what customer value means and how to create it. And I'm in a portfolio unlocker because I exist across the portfolio. I can help us unlock the thing that actually makes us unique. And it's the multimedia nature of the BBC and put that to work for audiences. So it's about clarity of choosing where you want to make the mark in the organization and then following that through quite relentlessly and um, in single mindedly and trying not to get too distracted by all the other facets of the role that need to be done. Because if I don't get this right, or if I do get this right, the impact could be fantastic on the organization. I could unlock so much and say absolute clarity about where your power resides and how you can really have impact. And then being a bit more single-minded on focusing on that at the expense of some other things, which won't please everybody, uh, but means you could actually maybe get something done. No, I think, I mean, listen, as a, as a strategy consultant in the old days, uh, I, I think we spent most time helping clients choose. Yeah. And for example, in, in, in brand positioning work that we did together. Uh, so it's as much about what you stop. I remember us doing sessions, uh, you know, what do we start? What do we stop? And what do we continue? And, and the stop part is often the hardest to, 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 really, uh, to really say, no, we're not going to do this. Can you, can you give me one or two examples of things that at the BBC you, didn't, you chose explicitly not to do, although they might have been part of the brief? Um, it's a good question. I probably have, rather than stopped, it's where I've put my time and energy and what I've not chosen to be focused for. So I, I guess um, yeah. on the marketing communication side, so chief customer officer and I run marketing and I think people know my background will think, well, you're going to spend your center of gravity thinking about brand and positioning and kind of marketing. And yeah, we've had work to do there. And so that's going on. But all of that, that the brand exists at the purpose of customers and to create value for customers. And so I've sort of in a way decided that I will do some of those things in a secondary way or with a different trajectory. Because if I can't help the organization understand how to understand what value looks like for customers and how to focus on which things to do to create it nothing else will really kind of matter so I probably have downgraded some of the aspects of the role that people thought I would come in to do and focus on some of the others I guess so well I mean I think that's 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 also courageous because it's safer to play in the area where if you've proven yourself many times over um yeah respect um so we've talked about curiosity Context, clarity, all Cs. We're not going to a 5C model, right? <laughs> no, I tried. <laughs> What's the fourth, uh, Ferris? Uh, I've tried to do the 5Cs. This one is a C and it's uh, about creative storytelling. And I think, but very much focused inside the organization. And as marketers, quite rightly, and I probably spent the first 20 years of my career thinking my job really existed to create value for customers and to spend all my energy on how to grow outside, how to grow with customers outside of the organization. Um, and I think there was a pivotal moment in my career when I kind of really learned there's massive power in inspiring inside an organization and marketing can have a phenomenal role inside an organization. Um, and that was when um, I was working with Tex Gunning who came new in to be the CEO of Axel Nobel from Unilever. Um, and he taught, he could see that uh, something we were doing inside my team 
could have power way beyond that which we had created it for. So we were working on how to build a really powerful story for the Dulux brand. It was very customer focused, um, an idea for the brand that was around sort of adding color to people's lives. And we were really excited about it because it was a very purposeful, powerful idea that we knew through our communications work was really connecting with customers and was really starting to show the signs of showing growth inside the business. What Tex did is he could see his job was he was bringing together two organizations with merged, well, actually, Axonavel had bought ICR. He had two big teams to come together at the time of the financial crisis. This was in 2008 when the world was imploding. He could see his job was how did he inspire ignite a spirit inside the organization how could he build a connection inside the organization and so he was turning this idea inside and said it's wonderful that we can grow outside I can see that if we can connect inside the organization we can unlock something and and bring this organization together so and he showed me how to do that we started working inside the organization with teams on what it meant for us how did we want to work we painted our offices we we sort of just connected ourselves back to why we existed. Um, yep. And it was shocking, surprising. You think, well, how naive of me not to realize the energy that could get created inside the organization, particularly because we were two companies coming together, yeah. suddenly were reigniting behind why we existed. And it was a massive learning for me that I think has stood with me for the rest of my career since 2008. Couldn't agree more, uh, Karis. I, I actually, in preparation for this call, uh, just this morning, I looked up the Let's Color project because the purpose was adding color to people's lives. We worked on that together. I see that Greg, he's actually uh, uh, filed a question. We might get to that later on uh, at, uh, at BBO, did that work uh, with us. Um, and, uh, and the Let's Color project, which reports the societal impact of adding color to people's lives is still life and, and has affected eight, more than 82 million people. Let's call a project.com uh, deserves a shout out. And, <laughs> and to add to um, your internal storytelling, it goes further. Because when, as a consultant at the time, Effective Brands, we we'd worked for quite some time, quite a few of my colleagues were involved. And when we existed 10 years, we invited all our employees to come together in Rio de Janeiro, uh, assistance included. And we actually worked with the Dulux team on regenerating and repainting the favela Santa Marta. And that was a, a pacified uh, favela. And, uh, and actually, I also remember standing you know, shoulder to shoulder with this, this youngster Brazilian boy who, who had handed in his gun. Uh, left gang life and was trained to become a painter, and uh, and when we when we closed shop when we when we uh, sold effective brands and we had a closing party, more than half the people wrote stories about how incredibly motivating, and that's just for the consultant, let alone it's your <laughs> own company. So yeah, I think that's a, that was a very special one. Uh, thanks. For that. Can I just pop in before we go to your last uh, recipe uh, elements? I, uh, I want to I wanna just uh, throw in one or two of the questions. Yeah. Simon Walsh, he asked, what was the best resurrected, resurrected marketing brief you uncovered in your, uh, I guess you know what he's referring to, mm -hmm. going through everything that's, that existed? Um, it would be very much in that British Airways example. And... Um, it was, it was actually Jill McDonald, um, who had been the former marketing director of British Airways, um, incredibly smart, went on uh, to be the CMO of McDonald's and CEO of McDonald's, not because it's the name. She had done some, um, I think, sort of positioning work um, on British Airways. Um, and this was the example of where actually a consultant said to me, oh, we did a really great piece of work with Jill, have you seen it? And no one in the organization could put their hands on it and say, so I got it sent back to me into, out from outside, inside the organization. It was unsurprisingly, it was a really good piece of work. It was, it was, um, it was, it was done really well. It's very thoughtful, it taken some time. Um, and we were just eight years on and a few things had shifted and we just updated it. We looked at it through a slightly different lens, but it saved me probably five months, six months, ton of money, 
Um, and as I say, it's one of those, when I talked to the organization about the work that we were doing and said, I took this work, some of you might remember Jules' work, a few people, senior people in the work said, I always thought that was really good. And I was disappointed we didn't act on it. It was one of those things I talked about where just not being the smart ass that comes in from the outside and says, I can tell you the answers, but saying, you have the answers, how can we do something with this? So yeah. well, I would say it's that British Airways positioning work that, that Jill had done, um, that we refreshed and added a bit more uh, context to it. And if, um, as I say, life had moved What's on. the positioning? What was the positioning statement? What's oh, I'm not gonna talk about that. <laughs> okay. I can't remember exactly, but I think um, where we sort of took it to was ultimately uh, saying, look, um, British Airways exists to just make flying feel a bit more special, but in particular, not just special for the special ones. I think British Airways yeah. quite naturally had gone where the revenue was. And if you were a club card flyer, a gold card, gold card holder flying in club, you're very valuable. I think one of the things we help the organization see is whole customers, your gold card holder on business is a premium economy flyer or an economy flyer when they're on holiday yeah. and you're treating them very differently but you could if you've got insight into the customer make them feel special when they're with a the family flying an economy not just when they happen to be flying in that that gold yeah. cup so it was a bit about how could you with the data and in fact we sort of said look well the unique thing we can do is connect data together to help the service everyone serving customers know a little bit more about customers and make everybody feel a little bit more special um and i think it, i i don't know quite where that went but I, I know it sparked off quite some big programs inside british airways but um it was it was a uh, some of it was founded on the insights some of the insights at least from, from jill's work yeah that makes makes a ton of sense and would recognize the experience also um yeah. so yeah it's it's you almost sound like a consultant that you put five c's together <laughs> I mean, it makes it stick. So. I've learned from the best, Frank. I'm learning from the best. So, <laughs> so what's your, your fifth C? My fifth C is about delivery. <laughs> um, <laughs> the C uh, of delivery. I love it. Delivery, uh, delivery on commitments. I don't know. I, I tried. I failed. Um, in all of those things, I think the one thing uh, is like, I just don't ever forget to deliver. <laughs> uh, a lot of lies, particularly in big jobs, are framing or strategy creation, and it's just deliver. And there's two elements to that for me. One is deliver on what you say you're going to do for people uh, and deliver results for the business. And, and just don't lose sight of that. Uh, if you don't deliver, you don't really have a right to exist, I think, uh, and just focus on delivering. But I think also delivering on commitments. And I remember um, uh, quite early on in my life in the BBC uh, with one of my peers, uh, some work in my team wasn't going very well. And I remember getting a phone call, quite a difficult phone call from a very senior person uh, who was very challenging of me. Um, and I didn't quite understand everything was going on, but I just remember saying, uh, I'll sort it, you don't know me very well. You just need to trust me, I will deliver for you. And, and I was being quite challenged on some things that I didn't think were quite right. And I just remember saying, you don't know me, but I will deliver for you. I will sort this and we will deliver. Uh, that's what you need to kind of know about me. Um, and luckily, <laughs> took a bit of time. We solved it. We sorted it. The work became really, really good and we delivered. But uh, it was just something I, I need in the early days. Who knows whether I'm going to deliver, right? Just because you've done it in the past doesn't mean to say that you can be successful in the future, but it was important to me, I think that it was a, a peer of mine that they could trust me to deliver uh, and I would sort this thing for them. That sort of mattered to me. And I think it's a, stood me in good stead and something I try not to forget. Is it because, because obviously very few people would argue with this, that you need to deliver. And it, it's a sort of obvious, but is what you're saying maybe also a little bit about how you enter, how you start, that, that you start with the end in mind, uh, to, to quote Kovi um, uh, again, um, mm. so that, that you have the delivery, the, the, the sense of urgency to, to actually deliver on, on what you promise right from the get-go. Is, is that also what you're saying? I think it, yes, I think that's probably right, Frank. And I think it, it comes from not by design necessarily, but being a bit of a serial CMO, right? So 
I've made uh, the first 20 years of my career were very stable, 10 years with Unilever, 10 years with the paint businesses. Um, and then I've uh, had a number of changes. And as I say, mostly by design, but not always. Life happens, right? And you find yourself in a different circumstance. And I think when you're in a new organisation and you've been hired and you're in a big job, you've got to, you've got to deliver and you've got to deliver some stuff quite fast. Um, so I think some of that delivery focus also comes out of in, you know, knowing that uh, people are relying on you to bring about a change um, and you better do something to deliver it. And I think having experienced that change, being hired into big organisations with big challenges at a senior level, it does bring it into a stark reality for you that you've got a job to do and you have, you've got to deliver for that organisation. I've often been brought in because something needs to change, something has to happen, either teams are coming together or something's not quite working. And so um, there's really, you know, you've, you've got to, to show some, some improvement and show some change. But I just think it's also maybe it comes from my insecurity, but I'm always worried that I'll get fired. <laughs> so <laughs> better get some results, right? Yeah, I like that. I'm just, uh, I'm getting a question in from uh, Richard Chapman, who, who says, who's inspired by and, and, and really um, r relates well to your comments about uh, curiosity and, and humility. And, and he asks, I think, a very good question is, uh, is how do you inspire that with others? How do you make teams, colleagues, horizontal, vertically, wherever, um, encouraged to, to adopt that same mindset and behavior? Oh, that's a good question. Um, good question, Richard. Um, that's a really good question. I think I've said a couple of things that sort of spring to mind. Um, I think uh, teams learn from how you behave, right? Obvious things. So if you spend more time asking questions Exactly. than giving answers yeah. and encourage them you know, people sort of I think certainly see that maybe you enjoy thinking about the questions thinking about the problems and if I'm if they if, if being in a meeting with me means I'm going to ask lots of questions then you start to realize that you need to sort of go out there and maybe think in that way so maybe something I think is is um the way you behave with your teams um uh I think being sort of very explicit and I think I often talk with my teams quite early on about what matters to me what I value what I think matters and just encourage people to 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 ask more questions than try and think about always having smart answers at some point you do need to have some answers so maybe just the way you are with teams and role modeling with teams yeah, yeah um, I agree I think it's 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 almost like again, the analog with parenting, where a lot of parents think that they really focus on what they say to, to their children. And I think in the end, it's 10 times more important how you behave because yeah. children yeah. copy you. And, and, and it's not very different to our working situation. Yeah. If you're a leader of a large team, they look at how you behave and they, they copy that. I couldn't agree more with that answer. I think within, within my peers, so um, I'm working with some you know, pretty powerful people in the BBC, Charlotte Moore, who now runs the whole of television and audio. I was working with James Pennell, who was working in audio. Uh, Fran Unsworth, who runs the whole of BBC News. These are very big, powerful people that got a lot on their plate. And uh, Actually, just some very obvious, simple things. We've been running some incredible audience connection sessions uh, where we set the foundation. So we don't pretend we don't know anything. We know a lot about our audiences. But then we actually in a COVID world have been doing a lot of virtual in-person sessions. So where we connect with audiences. And the great thing is you can connect with audiences across the country in one session uh, as opposed to the logistics of focus groups. We've been running lots and lots of connection sessions with senior people uh, and just sort of saying let's talk about this we you know, this is where the audience is and it's just opened eyes I think for some of the senior people about how they need to connect with their audiences in a slightly different way um, so I think just um, helping people connect with the customer connect with the audience giving them opportunities to do that yeah. um, even if it, you know, sometimes it plays against, you think, well, we know all these answers, right? And my team's got all this insight. 
but just hearing it, just connecting with it firsthand is, is, is difficult to replace. So that's maybe one of the other things that I would recommend. You're right, I, I totally right. So indeed, rather than, because you could have given all those answers to, <laughs> to those leaders, all these insights. And again, I think it's about demonstrating and, and, and listening rather than telling. So you listen to the audiences and, yeah. and so did they, yeah. Okay, so there's 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 a ton of other topics. Uh, we only have 15 minutes left, but let's let me select a few of them. One is uh, I was intrigued about your title, the, the chief customer officer, and and you've undoubtedly I know that watched the marketing space and you've seen chief communication or people did that brand and then called themselves CMO. Uh, then a lot of CMOs got either promoted or replaced by chief growth officers. We've had chief experience officers, your chief customer officer. What do, what do you I mean? What's your view on this whole thing, titles, and what does it represent? I think then that's the more the underlying question is what is this telling us about, about marketing and what do you believe in that is good and what what should what needs change? Um I think that I mean the, the, one of the reasons I was really excited. Um, to take on this role at the BBC was because it actually was actually ironically for an organization that some people don't think has customers right so um because everyone is, has to pay uh to be a chief customer officer um it was putting together a number of different functions and that was that was actually very exciting for me because ultimately um, you want to be driving growth, right? So what's interesting for me is growing things. <laughs> if I had to say, what are you? It's like, I like growing things. Uh, I like- You should have been called the chief growth officer. <laughs> so yeah, so it's growing things. Um, and it's, you know, but very much, you know, customers, audiences at the heart and sort of value creation and then helping organizations not just understand what customer value means to them, but working out what they can really do that can shift the needle on the dial. That was what was interesting for me about the opportunity at the BBC. That's why I've chosen to focus on some of the things that I'm focusing on. And I think that's what unifies most of those roles is um, when your role is a uh, customer value creator and a grower of things, you a, a growth driver. Um, I think that's what... Um, unites the best of those roles are, are the people that are at the heart of the organization you have unique perspective of the outside in but not only that you often can look inside the organization and work out how to connect the inside with the outside and i think it's that outside and the inside on the outside that makes these roles when they're crafted well or when you can craft them well yourself yeah. uh, so powerful you are the outside into the organization but what matters to me is understanding the levers inside the organization that you can unlock to connect them to that growth opportunity. And those are the roles that I think are what organizations need, not just um, too narrow. If it's too narrow that you can't be strategically helping the organization unlock the value, I think that's when they become narrow and less uh, impactful. So I don't know if that quite answers the question, but that's... Uh... No, no, so what you're saying, it's not so much about a title, it's really about the scope and, yeah. and, and the breadth of, of, of your focus and your role to drive, ultimately drive growth. Yes, yes. And, and to, for me, is to, to shape and craft the role such that you unambiguously understand what customer value looks and feels like. And the BBC is it's quite unique. Um, but how you understand the levers inside the organization and connect those that make products or make services to those levers so that you can really, really drive growth. That's what's interesting for me. And in the BBC, my role looks after the license unit. I'm the revenue generator. My team brings in the revenue, <laughs> the, the 3.9 billion pounds that comes from the license fee. My team bring it in. That matters to me actually, because I'm a revenue, I can be a revenue person as well as an audience and, and marketing person. So it, it gives me an insight into where the revenue comes from and why people pay. And if they aren't sure about paying, what you need, you need to do to solve it. And I think that revenue connection really, really helps. And that's one of the reasons why I was really excited about this role at the BBC. I'm, comm I'm a commercial person in, in a public service organization, but connecting to a, you know, 
the money won't flow if customers don't value you. And I think that's really what uh, I'm interested in, in helping organizations understand. And so, so great. I, I really like that answer. I want to link it to a question that I was not going to share because, because we agreed we wouldn't talk too much about politics. That's very BBC specific and maybe less of interest to the, to the audience. But uh, Greg Maudsley asked why he says, you know, the BBC has come under constant attack from Mr. Cummings. What's that mean for your role? And again, I'm less interested in, 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 let's say, the political side of the answer, but more the managerial side, the, the leadership side of this answer. I think it's not just my role, it's actually all of us in the BBC. And I think it's really simple. We exist to create public value. We exist for the audience. And the moment we lose sight of that and are distracted by other things, the moment we don't deserve to kind of have the mandate that we have. We exist, and Tim Davey, our new Director General, with us as the cross exit, we're very clear on this. We exist to create value for all. We believe in the principle of universality and our focus has got to be on creating value. And if we do our job, make amazing things, deliver impartial news, if we do our job, we'll be fine. And if we don't, we won't. And yeah. so everything else in a way, yes, people need to manage that, but it can be noise. And I think it's it, if you get distracted by that noise, we don't have an inalienable right to exist. We only exist if we're delivering on our public purposes. And so in a way, part of my job in this context is just to help the organization navigate the noise and say, keep the eye on the prize, keep the eye on the prize. We've got job to do, we have to, we've got some real challenges with audiences. We understand those, we can help create more value for audiences keep focused on that. So my job is just to make sure we know what we need to do and we keep focused on it and support others. There are you know, many stakeholders in all organizations. It won't just be the BBC. So in any organization, there are many stakeholders. And actually, as a storyteller, we can help those that are connecting with all of those stakeholders understand, well, how is what we do going to help that stakeholder's needs and interests? So I can help tell the story powerfully to different stakeholders, but the story is really about how we are gonna create more value for customers and serve audiences so that we continue to exist and people want to pay want to pay for us. So um, just help distracting from, from some of the noise. So that, that, that's obviously tightly linked to what you earlier said, your, your, your brutal focus on driving growth. And that's, that's what inspires you. We called our institute the Institute for Real Growth. And we have a, a very clear vision on what we believe real growth is. Um, how do you define growth? Um, well, I think it, it, it as you say, it, it, de it depends on probably the organization that you're in at the time. Um, for us inside the BBC and what I'm trying to do inside the BBC is uh, unlike every other business I've ever worked in, <laughs> we exist for all. Um, you know, one that, you know, the strategy is like, you can't be all things to all people, choose your battles, choose to focus and really make sure you deliver on certain audiences. It's very interesting working for an organization that exists for everybody. We have to create value for everybody. And so what I chose to focus on is you actually can't be all things to all people, but we need to be enough to all people. We have to create enough value for all people, not everything, but enough value for all people. And so inside the BBC, my job is how do you understand what enough value looks like? We actually can do that. We can do that. We've got some really clever cross media measurements that we, we can tell what actually constitutes behavior of the BBC that people think we're of value to them? And then decodify that, codify that, and then help the organization work out really what to focus on that's going to help more people get enough value from the BBC. So inside the BBC, growing is actually taking audiences that get value, but maybe not enough today. And I want to really get them so they feel they've got enough value from the BBC and they support us and they want to pay for us. So for me, it's growth is in those audiences that don't get quite enough today, 
and trying to make sure that enough of them get more value in the future. That's what growth looks like inside the BBC. Well, it's, 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 I was just thinking and reflecting on, on your career. And, and so our definition of, of real growth or more humanized growth is delivering value for all stakeholders for the long term, rather than short term focus on only sh uh, shareholder value creation. And I was just thinking, you know, when first time I met you at, uh, at Julux, you were actually already doing that. You were creating value for your colleagues for customers, also for the communities, just thinking of that favela in, in, in Rio and many others. I saw there were now more than 2,200 projects have been delivered of creating value for communities uh, over all these years and, yeah. and for shareholders because stock price did go up. And, uh, and so in a funny way, you're doing exactly the same at the BBC in a wildly different context. Yeah. <laughs> what, 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 what do you see, what do you see a shift happening in because we got viewers from all kinds of different industries. What, what's your perspective on changes when it comes to more humanized growth, to value creation for all stakeholders over the long term? Do you see any changes happening? There's a, I guess the, I, I would, the current context is providing a really interesting um, challenge to organizations on colleagues and uh, what's the deal that you have with your colleagues on, um, I guess, why they want to be part of your organization. And so I would say maybe one of the shifts, and it, it links back to some of the things I've talked about earlier, is of course, focus on customers and how we grow with customers. but in this changing dynamic is what does it mean to work inside the organization and why is this an organization that I want to commit my precious time and energy to um, and I think particularly with the changing ways in which we are working the opportunities that that creates some of the challenges that creates for people I would say maybe there may be an opportunity and a bit more of a shift to think about internal stakeholders, you know, to think about colleagues and uh, and teams inside the organisation. And uh, I think as we all probably all are reconnecting, the, what does good work look like? What does a productive, valuable working life look like? And how can we create more flexibility? Um, like many, for those of us that, have had the opportunity and privilege of working in a very flexible way because not everyone does many we often forget you know 15 percent of our organization we've got to keep broadcasting they are in buildings they're working um and you know the, the majority of the uk 54 percent of the uk country people are going to work we can often think as senior leaders that the whole world has a life like this where we're, we're in bedrooms and offices but they don't but it gives us an opportunity, I think, to think about what a new contract might look like inside an organization for valuable work, flexible work, uh, kind of meaningful work. Um, so I, I guess that's that's a, probably what might change in the future as a result of the circumstances that we find ourselves in, or I hope it does. Yeah, yeah, what, what, what I've noticed, if, if, so in that definition, we look at colleagues, consumers, uh, communities, and capital markets, the four C's, yeah. <laughs> unlike your five C's. But, uh, but anyway, so, so COVID has, I think, brought an enormous shift of focus from pre-COVID, mainly at consumers or customers and capital markets. And then COVID hit and all of a sudden colleagues in the communities that we operate in. Yeah. Got, uh, interestingly, I, I just got a comment that I want to quote because I really like it from Paula Alexander. Um, she, 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 uh, she says, great wisdom today, hearing many Unilever fundamentals. Uh, <laughs> and she says, growth is becoming a bad word, at least in the US among younger people. And she says, I really like enough value for all people as a great, mm. as, a, as a modern definition of growth. Uh, I, yeah, definitely agree there, uh, Paula. Thanks for that. Hey, um, we've got one minute left. Um, mm. and, and I want to use that last minute uh, for a very short answer to the question is there any recommendation that uh, any message that you want to share with this this audience of senior leaders before we go 
there's two things I've thought about. One is um, you asked me a question about how I've been growing as a leader. And I, as I reflected on that, I thought I've grown most when I've put myself out of my comfort zone, when I've taken on new big jobs. So I would encourage everyone, the only way you grow your comfort zone is to get out of it. So get a bit uncomfortable. Uh, in the long run, it's worth it. And then the second thing is um, I've been... You know, I think the job of a leader often is to make sure the reality is really understood and then you create hope. Um, and if I've seen things that are really connecting inside some of the work that I'm doing is when we say, this is what's going on. You, you, you can sometimes define a problem, but you then give an organisation hope that we can solve it. And that don't lose the sight of the energy that comes from creating hope inside an organisation. And I think right now, we all need a bit of hope. So I would say reality and hope, big, big jobs of leaders. Well, that's, that's fantastic. That's a, that's a beautiful close to what I found an extremely inspiring and engaging hour. I really want to thank you for that. I want to thank all the viewers. I also want to encourage viewers. We will, all of these uh, Humanized Growth webinars are available on our website as podcasts. You can stream them on Spotify as articles. Uh, in many different uh, formats, feel free to share them um, because I think uh, many people deserve to hear the wisdom of Karis and, and, and the other guests we've had. And with that, I want to thank you, wish you a beautiful day and weekend ahead. And Karis, again, thank you very much. And thank see you, Frank, and thank you everyone for listening. Thank you. Bye bye.